Happy Friday uh, to Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor College of Medicine as well. Um, I'm thrilled that we're getting a larger following of people who are just interested in, in uh, finding out more about what's going on here at Baylor College of Medicine. I mean, uh, what a week. It's hard, it's hard to describe this week as anything other than the strangest week uh, we ever had. For, for one thing, uh, I have been here now for 10 years and have never gotten our banana trees to actually grow edible bananas. But this week, we uh, collected a large bunch of really good bananas, and who knew they're going out there now? Uh, you know, we ate a few, and so far we're still living, so I think it's okay or it's safe to eat the bananas, but it's very excited about our garden. Uh, the second thing was we had a visit from the Surgeon General, uh, Dr. Jerome Adams, and the Deputy Secretary of Health and Human Services, Eric Hagan. I mean, how nice was that? They came in to see what we're doing. We spent two hours with them. A lot of interest in the research we're doing related to COVID, but more importantly, uh, what they really were, uh, wanted to do is give us a little bit of a shout out for the Moderna trial, a uh, very important vaccine trial, but they've been having trouble uh, recruiting enough uh, underrepresented minorities into the trial, and we have been one of the best at recruiting them uh, into our ongoing study, and so they wanted to give us a little bit of shout out, plus they also wanted to hear all the great science that we're doing. So that was, that was really great. Um, the other eventful thing uh, was Lily had her first cold, uh, a lot of sneezing this week, but she got through it. Uh, and uh, she even got to hang out with her friend Leo, and you'll see at the end uh, a little bit of a confrontation between Lily and Leo, which of course, Lily won. Anyway, let's talk about the data at the Texas Medical Center. Actually, in a really good series of weeks that we've had, if you look at the metrics we like to follow, uh, the effective reproductive number, which is the best evidence of whether we're winning or losing, it continues to be less than one and actually keeps falling. So we've been under one for about 20 days. Finally, our daily new case rate is getting close to that 200 number or under that 10 per 100,000 that we want. And our test positive positivity rate continues to fall. So that's all very good. Uh, we continue to have weird stuff going on uh, with the state releasing large boluses of results. Uh, and I woke up to NPR uh, a couple of days ago saying that Houston had just recorded its highest percentage ever of positivity, which is exactly the opposite message of what we wanted to say. And the reason for that is there was a release of 13,000 old cases uh, which you'll be able to see on our graph here, the ones in green, that totally skewed the data. And so those 13,000 cases were old and don't represent what's going on now. So if you're trying to understand what's going on now, we have to split out those old cases, take the new ones. And if you follow the new case rate, it's getting to where we want it to be. So I, I really was upset with NPR because that was misleading and I'm sure scared people but we're actually making a lot of progress. I'm very proud of our community because it's behavior that's doing that. It's, it's making sure that we're wearing our masks and, and staying distant. That said, because there's this delay in reporting, it's also possible that our case rate now is a little underestimated because we're, we may be waiting for cases that are in process that might be positive. But, I'm going to discount those and, and just from a general perspective, we're doing better. I know the county still has us at red, but the Klotman <laughs> dials are not at red. I think we're actually in a very good place. We're not at green yet. We're not down to that 1% or 2% positivity rate that we want, uh, and we're not under 200 cases. So we're not in a position where I would recommend everyone uh, starting to you know get looser and opening restaurants more, businesses more, even going back to face-to-face -face school. Even though I know the governor and the superintendents do what they want to do, it's just my own personal opinion, we're not quite there yet. And as the best example of that, just look what's happened in Europe. Uh, Europe went, you know, had the same kind of low numbers that we have now, started opening restaurants and bars, went back to school, and now they have spikes all over the place. And unfortunately, uh, New York City also had a big spike uh, in the Orthodox Jewish community, no doubt from religious ceremonies, aggregating people again. Uh, we, we are not yet in a position uh, to return to like 
the old days. And I will, I will say it again, uh, keep saying it. If you go to any place, anywhere, a restaurant, a retail store, uh, if you go to any service or any grouping where it looks like it's pre-COVID days, don't go in. It's just not right. We're not in that position yet. P people have to be in incorporating mask wearing and distancing in every single day, you know, from now on until we have an effective uh, vaccine. Now, we're, the good news is we may well have a, a vaccine soon. So, uh, not to be outdone by the CDC, which, if you recall, last week uh, had a giant blunder around the aerosols, uh, the WHO had to come out with uh, their own blunder, which is that uh, they, there was an announcement that asymptomatic transmission was incredibly rare. Well, <laughs> that's just so not true. Uh, and they had to walk that back. So, you know, you got you to gotta feel bad for these. <laughs> First the CDC and now the World Health Organization. And there were two really good publications, very large meta-analyses that showed that at the low end of asymptomatic transmission, it's probably 15%, but at the high end, it's almost close to 40%. And the difference really is in the low end, it's if you're 100% asymptomatic, in other words, you've never been sick at all and, and transmitted, that's fairly rare. But when you think about asymptomatic, that's also pre-symptomatic people. So if you're infected, it takes a while for the virus to you know, grow in you, and you're most infectious at around three or four days after infection before you develop symptoms, and then you develop symptoms. So that 40% number is taking uh, into account both asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic patients. But the main thing is people who are not sneezing and coughing can transmit the virus to you through speaking, shouting, singing, chanting. So these things are really important to remember when you're in any kind of group setting. Please wear a mask if you can't be socially distant and, and always wear a mask if you're inside. There's no question about that. The other thing I wanted to um, talk about a little bit is this issue of viral mutation. So, you know, I mentioned before that our, uh, our group, Joe Petrosino, was able to identify that this particular virus started off in a bad horseshoe bat ended up adopting or acquiring the spike protein from a pangolin, which, which then ended up being uh, in Wuhan. The very dominant strain from uh, in China was not that original strain, but with a single mutation. And then the, the virus that sort of took over Europe and uh, most of the US was a uh, particular mutation, uh, a D614 to G, in other words, an aspartic acid to a glycine mutation uh, in the one position in the spike protein. And that particular mutation is in a particular location in the spike protein that allowed it to stabilize. And so on the viral surface, there's more uh, spike proteins which make it more infectious. And that is the dominant strain worldwide now. Uh, there was a recent study just looking in Houston that most of the virus we had in the beginning was from uh, from New York City, probably from the European strain that, that with this particular mutation, mutation. There was some probably that came through Seattle uh, that was um, uh, the, the original virus. And very quickly, uh, the D614G mutation became the dominant strain here. So there was some uh, you know, discussion about whether or not uh, it was just a founder effect. In other words, somebody got infected with one strain and just spread it faster. But it's pretty clear in Houston, it's switched over because uh, this new virus is a little bit more uh, fit to infect people. That doesn't have any impact whatsoever on what will be an efficacy of a vaccine because the vaccine is directed uh, towards that spike protein and should be effective no matter what. So that's just an interesting thing that's going on in Houston in terms of our virus. And then one of the most interesting papers uh, that I've seen so far is we've had this real uh, kind of uh, we don't understand why certain people get really sick and die from this virus versus other people. And there was a really interesting paper that came out in Science this past week, and it showed that, uh, that the, some people have uh, a, a, a develop an antibody to a particular uh, me chemical in the body that's very, very important called an interferon. Interferons are, are chemicals that were first described in the 50s, and they're very important uh, for stimulating the immune system. It's part of what we call the innate immune system. So 
you know, we talk about antibodies being very specific to a particular, you know, antigen or protein or viral protein, but there's a whole other type of uh, immune response called innate immunity, which is like turning on the switch to a room or imagine it like a laser bomb versus carpet bombing. This is like carpet bombing. It's not specific for the, the, any particular protein, but it turns on the immune system. And the interferon is very important. It's one of those molecules. It's one of the reasons why we get fevers, why you get achy wakey when you get sick. All that stuff is really important for killing off viruses in general. It's not specific, but it just, because your body temperature goes up, it, it just, it's one way to, that it turns on the entire immune system, makes more T cells, more ability to fight the virus. And it turns out in about 10% of the people who die from this, it's because they have autoantibodies. They have antibodies directed at these interferons that are very important in fighting the virus. So this is a really interesting observation. And it's not induced by the virus. It's pre-existent. So there are people walking around that have intrinsic autoantibodies to this particular molecule that's very important for fighting the virus. And when people get infected with, uh, with uh, SARS-CoV-2, and they're not able to turn on this system because they have antibodies blocking them, then they get particularly sick. And so this is a real breakthrough because now we know at least why 10% of the people uh, who, who die from this, um, uh, ha what, the, what the issue is. And it may, you know, it, 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 it may be important for other diseases as well. So, you know, one of the things we'll have to figure out why those people have autoantibodies to interferon and, and what the reason is and are there other uh, diseases that are that are problematic because of this particular problem. Anyway, very interesting science, uh, both in the virus and what's going on with asymptomatic transmission. And then, of course, this new uh, understanding of why people are particularly susceptible. So, interesting week, once again, uh, where Baylor College of Medicine is, is in the hunt. We were thrilled that uh, the government is sending folks to come see what we're doing. Uh, it was great to see the Surgeon General here. And I wanted to finish with uh, a lot of the reason we're doing so well is because of the science that we have here. And the science uh, that we do has got to be funded some way. We, we have a ton of NIH grants. Uh, we do really well in, 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 in competing for funding. But in the beginning, when, you, when something happens quickly and you want to target you know, a response, want to start something new, you know, like our expansion of testing or developing you know, a, a, a new antibody to, to, to be able to detect the virus. Those things are not grant funded. Those are funded out of, uh, from our donor base. And I wanted to give a particular shout out to Tom Kaplan, who was the very first founding member of the President's Circle with a, a gift. And, and the funds from the President's Circle have been used to start a lot of these studies that right now are getting funded from the NIH, and we couldn't, uh, we couldn't do it without uh, the support of our donors. So thank you all so much. You are part of the, of the Baylor community, the extended Baylor community. And again, we couldn't be doing any of this without you, Baylor College of Medicine, the scientists, the researchers here, the educators, our doctors taking care of people, uh, our staff, all the, all the workers here and our learners. Really so thrilled to be part of this uh, community and thank you so much. We're gonna end today with a little, uh, uh, Leo came to visit for a week and it was a little bit difficult because Leo was suddenly in Lily space. Uh, and so they had a couple of, uh, you know, you had to duke it out. Have a great weekend. I uh, look forward to seeing you next week. Bye.